This is the University of Tampa. UT students travel from across the nation and around the globe to join a dynamic learning community. There are 150 academic programs, continuing studies for non-traditional students, and a highly ranked graduate school. Academic opportunities are extensive and rigorous, but this mid-sized residential campus retains a welcoming feel. With a student-faculty ratio of 16 to 1, students benefit from direct interaction with expert faculty, a faculty that is passionate about teaching and mentoring. Outside the classroom, UT enjoys a unique environment. Plant Hall, a national historic landmark, is surrounded by modern and historic buildings on 105 acres. UT's beautiful downtown riverfront setting offers a gateway to the heart of a vibrant city. Students are within walking distance of jobs and internships, and the recreational opportunities are endless, both off-campus and on-campus. Students live in upscale residence halls and enjoy diverse activities, including performing arts, guest lectures, nearly 200 clubs and organizations, and a nationally ranked NCAA Division II athletics program. The UT experience begins with an innovative first year program and continues with opportunities to challenge yourself in the honors program, to study abroad, to conduct research with faculty, to do an internship, to volunteer in the community, or to participate in multiple leadership programs. Explore your dreams, discover your talents, get ready to invent, innovate, and be a leader. This is the University of Tampa. So here we are for game two, the doubleheader between the Tampa Spartans and Nova Southeastern Sharks. If you were just with us not too long ago, you saw the Spartans lose 3-2 in a very close game. Now, I'm Taylor Storthy alongside... I'm Bruce Horsniak, and you see Spartans going with Mary Beth Feldman in the circle here for game two. And in game one, we saw Ashley Connor come in as the third pitcher for the Sharks, and she will be the starting pitcher here in game two for the visitors. So after a foul ball there, the count falls to 0 and 2 for the lead off batter. That's Sydney Legere, lead off hitter. Legere had a good outing last time, and we'll foul that one off here. We can take a look for Legere last time, who was one of four in that Nova Southeastern win as she stays alive in the count. So it'll be good to see Mary Beth Feldman in the circle for the Spartans the afternoon game here. That one's going to be fouled away, so a good job at Legere to stay alive. The Spartans have now lost three in a row after having not only won three in a row, but they actually had one. Seven out of eight. The good news for the Spartans, at least, is that they're not losing by that much. They've had some close games, but 
It makes it sting even more that in their last two games, they've scored four runs and left 18 runners on base. Their overall one loss record following that game one defeat here earlier today is now 11-7. It's going to be a line drive up the middle, so a good job to stay alive in the at-bat by Legere. And that will be a single. We saw Feldman try to reach out for it, but just a little bit too fast for her. Can't react quick enough. And so that will bring up Riley Langwell. And she checks her wristband. Just like we were seeing from the Sharks pitchers in the first game. Going to drop a bunt to throw to first. Not in time. So the sacrifice works out in Langwell's favor. And now we've got two runners on with no outs. A tough start for the Spartans in game two right here. And actually nothing was sacrificed because they didn't get an out. And so the Sharks picking right back up where they left off. Keep in mind in that first game, they scored the runs in the sixth and seventh innings. So it's almost as if they're just continuing from game one despite the break in between the two games of this doubleheader. And they've looked great. Last night we saw the Sharks not lose their composure after being down two to nothing after five innings. Came back and won that one. Yeah, won game one. Now they got two first two runners on. Yeah, now it's a chance here with another bunt, although that's gonna miss for Tia Williams. And that'll be, she's now down 0 and two in the count. But yeah, on that last play, Langwell failed the sacrifice, instead getting a, a bunt hit. So, you know, I don't think she's going to be disappointed that the sacrifice didn't turn out the way it was expected, of course, because it still worked. <laughs> uh, anyway, the 0-2 count to T. Williams here. Williams is going to pop that up, but E.J. Jansen is going to be able to corral it nice and easy. So, we'll have the first out at the top of the first. The Sharks, meanwhile, have improved to 12-7 and seven by way of that victory in Game 1 of the doubleheader. So Janowick is going to step up here. Janowick went 1-3 of three with a double in the last game. Looking for a good start here. First pitch will be taken for strike one. The 0 1 is swing and a miss, so an 0 2 count with one out. And a good job there by Feldman in the circle to battle back after surrendering two opening hits. The as crowd has stayed here in the stands in this game despite the temperature now being up to 87. As you see, the strikeout there. And if you were with us for game one, we're glad that you stayed with us as well here in the Sunshine State Conference Digital Network as the Spartans and Sharks in a long afternoon of softball here with game one going the full seven innings. The Spartans did score in the bottom of the seventh, but fell one run short. So it's going to be grounded to short. The throw to first is in time and the side is retired. Two runners get on with hits, but Nova can't bring him home. And the Spartans escape the first inning without any damage. We'll be back in just a second for the bottom of the first the Spartans will hope to generate some offense right here and right now. Just another ordinary day at UT. We are ready to start the bottom of the first inning. 
Mariah Galhaus to lead things off for UT. And as I mentioned, facing pitcher Ashley Connor. See her chasing the wrist, checking the wristband. And Galhaus sends the first one deep to left field and caught routinely for out number one. Galhaus quite proficient in the first game, two for four with two RBI, but goes down as the first out here in the bottom of the first of game number two, and that'll bring up Lauren Fantone to face Ashley Connor and Fantone, the Spartans' left fielder. That first pitch will be taken outside by Fantone. Fantone was one for three in game one. Actually, it was called a strike. Once again, I think that's just the commentary booth's, uh, hey, that looked like a ball, but no, indeed was a strike. This time it is a ball, one and one. That one's going to be lined to left field, and it will get down. So Fantone will get on base with a single. Nice job by Fantone there in the number two spot in Leslie Cantor's batting order. And that sets up nicely for Corinne Miner coming up here with only one out. There were two hits by the Sharks in the top of the first, and so the Spartans have their first. And there's a drive deep to left by Miner, but it's going to be corralled very well by Smith. Tagging up and getting to second will be Fantone. Yeah, it's too bad Miner, we mentioned on last night's broadcast, that she had her streak ended of three consecutive games with a home run and looked like she wanted to try to start a new one there, although the good news was that it went deep enough that it did allow Fantone to tag up and advance to second. Now with the runner on second, Chevalier has a chance with two outs to try to get the first run across for the Spartans. Strike one is going to be taken. And so far, Connor has been very solid in the circle for Nova Sharks, being able to close out two wins. Both of those wins being 3-2 for the Sharks, and now is going to be called upon for a longer stint for the start. Chevalier is going to send that high, and Alexis Smith gets under it, and the side is retired. The Spartans get a hit, but strand the runner. It's been a quiet first inning, still 0-0. We'll be back with the second inning right after this. For college sports. There's light at the end of the tunnel. A return to normal and all we love about sports. You've instilled resilience, focus, and selflessness in us. We've put those lessons to work. We've found strength and unity in each other. You continue to take us places we never imagined. You bring out the best in us. So when we look forward, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We see a better world for all of us. And, and for college sports. sports. In NCAA Division II, student athletes leave a lasting impression on their communities. That's because Division II student athletes want to make a difference and truly be part of their surrounding communities. Through community engagement, thousands of student athletes from various backgrounds interact with community members who view them as role models. This interaction leaves a positive and perhaps even life-changing impression on all those involved. In Division II, we rise to the opportunity and make community engagement ours. And we are back and ready to start the top of the second inning as you see Mary Beth Feldman going through her warm-up pitches as the Spartans and Sharks scoreless after one inning and this inning for the Nova Southeastern University Sharks will see the six seven and eight hitters which begins with Madison Fine she is the catcher for the visitors and Madison Fine in game number one was the designated player. Went one for two with an RBI. So Fine will be an interesting player to watch right here as Feldman gets ready for the first pitch of the second inning. That one is going to be taken for strike one. And yeah, one of two, one RBI. Definitely a piece of the puzzle 
for Nova Southeastern's game one victory. Trying here to do something. That's going to be fouled backwards. Snell. Feldman will go ahead one and two. And the count. So here we go. 0 2 right here. That one's going to be taken high now for one and two. And a good start in the circle for Feldman. Surrendered two hits in the first inning. However, was also able to get a strikeout and retire the side without a run allowed. Hoping to continue it right here. One, two. Fouled away again. So the at-bat will continue. Madison, Pont, Madison Pine from just over the bridge in St. Pete. One of four local players on this roster for Nova Southeastern, which is actually located down in Fort Lauderdale. A quote-unquote home game of sorts for Madison Fine, right in her backyard. It's always good to be able to play at home and in your own backyard. And there are a lot of fans for Nova Southeastern here, but the Tampa fans will be happier on that play as the flyout will be tracked down by Avery Perkins to retire the first batter of the inning. Good catch out there by Avery Perkins battling the sun. As we were mentioning, it's a sunny, warm day, and that poses all sorts of challenges for the players to have to deal with. And now, the next person to step up and face those challenges for the Sharks will be Haley Hendricks. First pitch is taken for ball one. Haley Hendricks, the Sharks' second base player. And she went one for three with an RBI in game one of the doubleheader. That one will be popped up and foul. As it rolls off the net, the count falls to one and one. And yeah, Hendricks was also able to score an RBI. And it is a real game of inches and a game of runs. And whenever you can bring one home, it'll help out as Feldman calls for time just for a second. The umpire says, hey, just hurry it up a little bit along. So now the one and one from Feldman. That is going to be taken for strike two as it actually rolls off of Chevalier's glove. count now in Feldman's favor. The one and two pitch coming right up. That one goes high for ball two. We saw in the first game that both teams jumped out early. I remember at one point in the broadcast three runs apiece, or excuse me, three hits apiece early on and we've seen three combined between the two so far and one and a third here as another one is followed back to the screen. A great job by Hendricks to stay alive in the at-bat. So he'll have a 2-2 again. And so far, entering the at-bat, Feldman has had 19 pitches. Not a terrible start, but I know she'll be annoyed at having that pitch count continue to rise with some great fouls like that. That's going to be fouled into the dirt. Almost looked like a miss, but got enough contact to stay alive. Still 2-2. Two and two. We can hear some fans chanting for Tampa, chanting for Haley on Nova. There is going to be a pop fly tracking it down. It'll be Russo. And the second out is away here in the second inning. He talked about fans yelling for certain players, and you could hear Alexa Russo calling for that one all the way up here. Wanted to make it very clear as Emily Jansen, Spartan's first base player, and Avery Perkins, the right fielder, both eyeing up that pop fly. Swing and a miss for strike one right there. So that will give Feldman the advantage against Burke in the count. Samantha Burke is the number eight hitter in the Sharks lineup. She is their shortstop. And that one's going to be taken outside for ball one. 
Burke was Burke was 0 for 2 in game one of the doubleheader. So Burke will definitely be trying to do a little bit better this time around. Here comes the one and one from Feldman. That's just going to be a tad bit high. So it's now two and one on the count. A chance for the Spartans to get a 1-2-3 inning after surrendering two hits in the first. That's a swing and a miss again. Good stuff there from Feldman to force the swing and miss. And now, two's all around. Nova only two hits, but the 2-2 count with two outs. And the number 32 trying not to strike out. And strike three... So now you can ring that up as the second strikeout for Feldman. Another two on the board as the top half of the second comes to a close. The Spartans will be up next. And due up will be Alexa Russo, followed by Emily Jansen. And a substitute coming in for the game, Miranda Perez, who's actually starting. We'll be right back. Being a champion takes more than skill, more than endless drills more than using your head. Being a champion takes the heart to give it your all, the agility to thrive from any angle, and the relentless drive to be the best. Welcome to Division Two, where the pursuit is yours to create, and the question isn't, can you do it? It's will you. Bottom of the third is underway. Alexa Russo will step up for the bottom of the second. Can get a little confused as Russo is the number 33 and will foul that backwards. Strike one. Russo was 0 for 4 in game one of today's doubleheader. Looking to turn things around here in game two, obviously. Russo notably as well was the final out for the Spartans in that game. Trying to get a little bit of revenge on Connor, who was the pitcher to retire her to finish the game. So one and one with a pitch in the dirt. <clears throat> That's going to be taken. First strike, two. Seeing some movement in the American flag. The breeze going from right to left. And the 1-2 on the way. That one's going to be driven deep to the outfield by Russo. But Smith will track it down and make the catch. And that will retire the first batter for the bottom of the second. And so now we'll see Emily Jansen, the Spartans' first base player. Jansen 0 for 3 in game 1. Stepping in here to face Ashley Connor in the bottom of the second. Jansen's going to get a pop fly, and it won't be able to land as there's a good play right there by Burke to track it down, and that'll mean there are two away in the bottom of the second. Different face from what we saw in game one as the Spartans... Now I have Miranda Perez up to bat. Perez is going to take the first pitch, which is a ball. And yeah, a little change from what we normally see as Perez wasn't in the game last time. Perez hitting 333 this season, albeit on two for six through six games played. Perez will foul that one off. And the count falls to one and one. 
So entering the at-bat, Connor only had 11 pitches, one and two-thirds of work, which is really good, and only surrendering one hit so far, trying to go a one-two-three inning right here. So from the circle will be the one and one. That's going to be taken for strike two. Perez is a local product of sorts from just up I-75 in Wesley Chapel. Playing here with no score yet in the bottom of the second. Two balls, two strikes, two outs. Perez awaiting the next pitch from Ashley Connor. It's now the 2 2 to Perez, but two outs. And it will be taken just outside for ball three. And a good job by Perez to get a deeper at bat. And now get into a full count situation. Try to get on base. The payoff pitch right here with two outs. That will be fouled back and lands just in time. So the Madison Fine, who's back behind the plate this game, won't be able to get it. Last time out, Fine was playing as a designated player. But this time, it is at the two spot as the catcher. Full count once again. Strike three, the side is retired. Connor gets her first strike out of the game. And it's a very quiet inning. Both sides going one, two, three. Top of the third is up next. Still tied, 0-0. Zero, zero. Welcome to the University of Tampa. My name is Tucker Whitman and I'm a junior marketing major here at UT. Today we're going to look at some of the highlights of our beautiful Riverside campus here in downtown Tampa. We'll start at Plan Hall. This historic building was opened in 1891 as the Tampa Bay Hotel and now serves as the main academic building here at UT with four floors of classrooms as well as faculty and administrative offices. Next up, the Vaughn Center, the hub of campus life and activities. This multi-purpose building includes the campus bookstore, our primary cafeteria plus an additional food court, a theater, as well as offices and meeting rooms for student organizations. The Vaughn Center is also one of UT's residence halls, providing five floors of student rooms. Morsani Hall is another residence hall here at UT. In addition to housing approximately 450 students, this building offers another selection of eateries as well as a small grocery store. Now let's check out the Sykes College of Business. This academic building houses classrooms and faculty offices for UT's undergrad and graduate business students. This building also has a real-time stock trading room. Right next door is the Sykes Chapel for Faith and Value. This gorgeous interfaith chapel features a large main hall complete with a massive pipe organ as well as meditation rooms and meeting rooms. Student healthcare is a major... So we are back at the top of the third here at the Namoli Family Stadium. Still a 0-0 game with Feldman in the circle and uh, Feldman's had a pretty decent season so far. Well, so far this afternoon she does have two strikeouts already. And through two innings, has only faced eight batters. And it seemed as though that was going to be the case. What with having seen Corinne Miner last night and then Mariah Galhaus in game one. And on the season, Mary Beth Feldman, she has a 2-0 and one loss record, has only started three games, pitched 16 and two-thirds innings, eight walks, and twice as many strikeouts. 17 specifically and Feldman with a 0 0.42 ERA as you see her working here in the top of the third against the left fielder Alexis Smith and that strikeout rate gives her a 714 K through 7 which is pretty efficient averaging at least one strikeout per inning now 2-1 count here it's Alexis Smith who opens up the top of the third. Smith will foul that away, so the count now goes to two and two. Wind picking up quite a bit. We'll see if it sticks around, and if so, if that comes into play at, at all. We have seen over the course of game one and so far in game two some long fly bows to the outfield. As you see a strike out there as Williams, excuse me, as Smith goes down as out number one here in the top of the third for the Sharks. 
And so that is Feldman's third strikeout of the game. Already doing a good job of winning against these Nova Southeastern hitters. As we're back to the top of the order. And Lejeune, who was able to get a hit last time out. Lejeune was actually down 0-2 to start the at-bat in the first, but fought back and was able to get on base. Hoping to do the same after going down 0-1 here. It's going to be a pop fly to left. And a good job by Fantone to track it down. Yeah, nice job there by Legere to get under it. Almost got it to drop. And an equally impressive effort defensively by Lauren Fantone to get over in time to make that catch for the second out. So now two outs here. And the first pitch is going to be taken for strike one. Langwell is also one of one. He was able to get on with a nice bunt last time. Feldman will be hoping to try to complete a 1-2-3 inning. Here's the 0-1. That will be taken high. Now it's 1-1. One one. That second pitch of the at-bat, Feldman has now reached 40 in the game so far with two and two-thirds played. And there's going to be a fly to right. It's called and tracked down by Perkins. Rose, to, Rose her hand and called out for it. We can still hear it a little bit from the booth. And able to secure the 1 2 3 inning for Feldman. The side is retired, and the Spartans are now due up in the bottom of the third. This is the University of Tampa. Explore your dreams, discover your talents, get ready to invent, innovate, and be a leader. This is the University of Tampa. It's not about any one thing. It's about how everything comes together, how it all connects. People, ideas, resources, community, everything. Quality of life services. That's what we do. Sodexo. It's time to turn it up for the bottom of the third inning. Ballmer will be leading off here. Ballmer's still in the midst of a hitting slump, hoping to get back on base. Right here, as the first pitch is taken for strike one. Yeah, you recall in the first game, we saw Ballmer lifted after being 0 for 2 in favor of a pinch hitter that actually paid off. And so now here she is batting for the first time in game two to start off the bottom of the third. As you see, that one rolled in. And as that one goes into the dirt, the count will fall to one and one. Ballmer now ready, the one one. That's gonna be driven to left, but Alexis Smith will be able to get under it. And the first out will be put away. The slump continues, and that was similar to the first that Bat Ballmer had in the last game. Good contact and a fly out to left field. And now Avery Perkins is ready to go. Perkins will take that one for strike one. Connor checks the wrist and fires the 0-1. That's going to go low and away for ball one. Avery Perkins was one for two in game one and scored one of the Spartans' two runs. With Gallhouse on deck, I know Gallhouse would love it if she had a chance to bring in Perkins. Perkins get on base. That's going to be fouled away, so the count will go to one and two.
One two count here for Perkins. And here's Connor firing from the circle. That will be taken outside for ball two. Perkins, a quick look over at her coach, Leslie Cantor, over at third base and ready for the 2-2 here coming from Ashley Connor. The 2-2, be able to line it down the line, gets past Williams. And now we'll put a runner on with one out from Mariah Gallhouse. Yeah, good job by Avery Perkins there on that at bat and just found the sweet spot in between shortstop and third base and able to give the Spartans a base runner which sets up nicely for the leadoff hitter Galhouse. As I mentioned, she reached base three times in game one of this doubleheader. Yo to Galhouse. It's gonna be taken for strike one. Now notably as well, the two hits so far for the Spartans have come from left-handed hitters. Maybe that could be a secret to success against Ashley Connor, who's had great stuff as well when facing right-handers. The one here to Gallhouse. Gallhouse is going to get under that, and it'll be an easy fly out to first. So now two away, with Fantone stepping up, who has the other hit for the Spartans in this game. Fantone will take the first pitch. And this is rules a ball. The 1 0 here to Fantone. Connor checks the wrist. Readies from the circle. And fives. That's grounded right to her. Makes a simple play. The side is retired. One runner stranded on one hit. And it's still a 0-0 game entering the top of the fourth inning. We'll be right back on Tampa Spartans TV on the Sunshine State Conference Network. Being a champion takes more than skill, more than endless drills, more than using your head. Being a champion takes the heart to give it your all, the agility to thrive from any angle, and the relentless drive to be the best. Welcome to Division Two where the pursuit is yours to create. And the question isn't, can you do it? It's will you. What do you get when you take your favorite food and stuff it inside a pocket of homemade dough? Cook perfectly until golden brown. It's a mouth-watering empanada from Mr. Empanada. No one makes a better empanada. Take Ted Webb's word for it. Almost as good as my mom used to make. Check out our website for a location near you. MrEmpanada.com And we're back here at the Namoli Family Stadium in a game that feels different from game one in that this one is starting to feel like a little bit of a nail-biter. The two teams have combined for four hits and in game one when it was at the point in the broadcast where I had said that they had three each it felt like there was going to be some offense this one here it seems like it's going to be a very low scoring game as you see the very first pitch flown out to left field for out number one and just like that Tia Williams is retired by Lauren Fantone and that's exactly to my point that this looks like it could very well go down to the wire and maybe be a one nothing game maybe a two to nothing a two to one type game whereas game number one even though it only finished three to two looked like it had the potential for even more offense than that as you see a base hit there by nova southeastern so a good play and a quick start to the inning with two balls in play one of them was caught in left field by fantone but the other one gets down for a single and a good job there by ali janowick we didn't even have time to introduce her before she got on base but yeah indeed it feels like both teams have been really hitting into a wall for the most part, not able to generate a lot of offense. Good job from Feldman in the circle. But now with a runner on with one out, trying to make sure nothing else major happens. 
On the contrary, we've got Emerson Morris hoping to provide an extra spark to the team's offensive firepower. So the 1-0 after the first pitch taken for a ball. Now one is going to be driven deep to left. Fantone chasing and gets it. Tagging up and heading to second. And safe is Janowick. They got it in nearly in time, but I think it was just a tiny bit behind on the tag. It's hard to turn around and make the tag quick enough to try to get a batter out. Well, and the ball was hit deep enough to left field, but I still credit Lauren Fantone and then even Balmer on the relay to have it close enough that I think everyone hung on the edge of their seat to see what the umpire's call was. But it was just a little bit too deep to left field. That probably made the difference in the safe versus out call. And now we'll put a runner in scoring position with two outs after Fine takes the first pitch for a ball. That one goes low for ball two. Madison Fine flew out to right field in the second. And Fine will be hoping not to have that happen again. That's going to be taken for strike one. And a good job from the circle to battle back by Feldman. Entering the at-bat, Feldman only at 45 pitches with three strikeouts and three hits allowed. Here's the two and one. That's going to be grounded to third and a good grab by Curran Miner and the side is retired. And we've already mentioned how good Miner is at the bat and on the circle, but also at third base getting on that and firing it to first. Retires the side. The Spartans will be up next. And you know what? Speaking of Curran Miner, she'll be leading off the bottom of the fourth. We'll be right back. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I am an NCA student athlete. And I pledge to be a champion of unity on my team, on my campus, and in my community. I pledge to embrace differences and strive for inclusion and collaboration. I pledge to stand against racism, hate, and discrimination. I pledge to strive for love, care, and forgiveness. I pledge to stand against silence, deceit, and obscurity. I pledge to strive for dialogue, truth, and understanding. I pledge to stand against fear and doubt. I pledge to strive for trust and belief in one another. I pledge to stand against complacency and stagnancy. I pledge to strive for change and growth. I commit to supporting my fellow student athletes in all circumstances that impact them. I commit to both choosing unity personally and encouraging it for all. I pledge these things because we are stronger together. United, United as, as one. one. You know, YMCA is always a fun song to enjoy. We'll be back in just one second for the fourth inning. And we are back right away. You mentioned Corinne Miner will lead things off here. And what a tremendous play she made defensively to close things out in the top of the fourth. And just shows you the many tools that she has, the contributions that Corinne Miner makes whether it's defensively from third base, whether she's pitching, whether she has the bat in her hands, as she does now. The and first pitch, however, will be fouled away, and just out uh, far enough that it can't be corralled. Unfortunately for Curran, very uncharacteristic of her to go 0-4 in the last time out. That was a few defensive plays that were made very well. And her first at bat, she flew out on a good play in the outfield again. The 0-1 here to Miner. That's going to be taken inside for strike two on the outside corner, just stuck in. So the 0-2 here for Miner. Connor hoping to get the first batter out. That's going to be grounded to short, not going to be handled well enough. So Miner reaches base on an error. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I think we saw Samantha Burke commit an error similar to that from shortstop in game one. And as Corinne Miner was there at bat, I thought, you know, she's a proficient enough hitter that you mentioned her going hitless in the first day game, but she kind of has the reputation that you know she's not going to go on any kind of an extended hitting slump. And even if it takes an error by the opposing team, as you saw there, she will get on base eventually and has here in the bottom of the fourth. Chevalier is just going to drop a sacrifice bunt, which works. Miner gets to second, and Chevalier out at first. 
And nonetheless, just like that, the Spartans have themselves a runner in scoring position. And with, as I mentioned before, this shaping up to be a defensive battle, this is certainly an important opportunity for UT. You need to strike while the iron is hot with only one out. And so Alexa Russo, the number five hitter in the order, stepping up to bat now of facing Ashley Connor. And strike one to Russo. Chevalier hasn't done well against Connor so far. Notably had the final out in the previous game and also had an out in her first at bat. So she's going to want to get revenge against the player in the circle that potentially could help give the Spartans a lead. That one's going to be driven to center field. It will be caught on a good run there by Legere, and it's shallow enough where Miner can't tag up. So EJ Jansen will now go come up to the bat with two outs. Jansen is also 0 for 1 today. Connor looks at the arm and is ready to fire from the circle. That's going to be taken for strike one. And Bruce, we had mentioned before, Jansen is the tallest player for both teams today. And that also can complicate things with a slightly larger strike zone. And a good heads up play there by the catcher Madison Fine outside of that strike zone and making sure that there wasn't going to be an opportunity for Corinne Miner to advance to third. So that one missing the slightly larger strike zone. That is going to be ball one. And that one is able to hit Jansen, but there was also a swing, which means the count now goes to one and two. A little bit of an uphill battle now. You don't want to waste that runner that's in scoring position, and that's kind of been the challenge for the Spartans. Nine runners left on base last night, nine runners left on base in game one. That will be fouled away, so the yeah, bat will continue. Never mind a player or two that might have a hitting slump. That's really what the Spartans have to break through is converting when they have runners in scoring position. Over two in those instances so far in this game. So the one and two to Jansen. That's going to be in foul territory and caught for the final out of the inning. It's a good track down there by Tia Williams. And one runner will be stranded once again for the Spartans. And that'll end the bottom of the fourth. Still scoreless entering the top of the fifth. So we'll have to see. If Hendricks, Burke, and Smith can do anything as they're the next three up for Nova Southeastern. We'll be right back. What have we here? Another random school of fish. Watch as they mimic each other's every move. Even their own mothers can't tell these fish apart. In this school, there is no room for individualism. These fish live in fear. I think they should get maybe another level. This is the University of Tampa. Explore your dreams. Discover your talents. Get ready to invent, innovate, and be a leader. This is the University of Tampa. And we're back here at the Namoli Family Stadium. Score is still 0-0. And this has, in fact, turned into a real defensive battle. Three hits for the Sharks, two hits for the Spartans. And here we are already in the top of the fifth as the Sharks trying to sweep the three-game weekend series. What with a pair of 3-2 to two victories took extra innings last night. And then seven complete in game one here today. So here is the 1-0 after the first pitch for Hendricks is taken as a ball. Hendricks had a solid outing with an RBI going one for three last time. That one's going to be taken for strike one. Keep in mind that the Sharks are trying for 
their sixth consecutive victory. And the Spartans are hoping to not lose four in a row. So it'll be a battle of which streak survives. Although, if Nova wins, both streaks survive. Unfortunately for the Spartans, it would mean their losing streak continues. But, but good for the Sharks, it would be their winning streak that continues. The 2-1 here from Feldman. The bunt will be laid down. Jansen picks it up. The throw to first is in time. Retiring Hendricks. And I stand corrected. They actually have won six in a row. It's not updated yet on the Sharks' website. Uh, so they're actually going for seven in a row if they can take this second game of the doubleheader. They had won four in a row coming into last night. And then, as I mentioned, a 3-2 to two win last night in eight innings, a 3-2 to two win in seven innings. And trying to get one more here before they move on. The Sharks, by the way, will next play on Friday, a week from yesterday. And that's going to be two games that day, albeit against different teams playing over in Winter Haven, Florida. They'll play Bloomfield at 2.30 and then Grand Valley State at 4.45. And, of course, the Spartans, as I mentioned already, have doubleheaders next week, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. The 2 to Burke is fired out of play, and ricochets off the pole near the bullpen. It's now two and one count here. Feldman entering the at-bat at that only 53 pitches, and four and a third of work. Ready to go with the 2-1. That is going to be taken for strike two. It's to Burke now, 2-2 two -two count. Burke is hoping to get some action going for the Sharks. And the circle Feldman hoping the Spartans can get a second out. That one is taken for ball three. Burke stays alive. Feldman should feel good about herself regardless of the outcome of this at-bat, though. She's really held the Sharks in check here in the second game. And that one will be fouled away, so we will have another full count pitch right here. And I don't think that ball is coming back down. So now we've got another 3-2 count. The payoff pitch to Burke. Fouled away once more. So good job by Burke to extend the at-bat. Feldman is, for all intents and purposes, averaging four batters faced per inning, which at one above the minimum, barring it being a home run, is it's pretty good. Very acceptable. Very acceptable. At this rate, however, it definitely will be a fourth batter, as it's a good eye by Burke to draw a walk, the first one for either team in the game. Alexis Smith will now step up here with a runner on first and one out. Smith, the number nine hitter, 0 for 1. In this game, she struck out in the third. And there's a big swing and a miss for strike one. And one thing that's been noticeable for Feldman is that Feldman has had a lot of stuff behind her pitches, being able to force a lot of swings and misses, more so than what we see from Miner and Dollhouse. That one's going to be fouled away for strike two been a busy game for Alexis Smith in left field. Charity has six putouts. Tampa generating a lot of balls into the outfield, giving a lot of work for Nova's outfielders. And the 0-2 to Smith, that will be taken low and away for ball one. Feldman readying up the 0-2 one more time. The runner on first. Still posing a minor threat of stealing if needed. That one's taken again, low and outside for ball two. Yes, yeah, Samantha Burke is definitely ready to run down at first base. And certainly Smith hoping to advance her in some way, shape, or form. 2-2 on the way from Feldman. Here's the 2-2 to Smith. Smith will foul that away. Lands out of play, and yet bat will continue. So a good job by the Sharks to try to force some longer at bats. But Feldman 
ironically, even with the heat, not breaking a sweat out there. Readying up the 2-2. Two -two. One out and a runner on. That one's going to be taken for ball three. Smith has fought back to a full count. The second full count in a row for Feldman. Feldman won't want to concede another walk this time. So we'll have to see how the payoff pitch goes. That one is going to be a fly out to Russo. That's the second out. I was thinking right before that pitch, we've yet to see a double play today, and that certainly would have been a great time for it, although Spartan's certainly happy that there's now two away in the top of the fifth as they'll look to retire Sydney Legere as she now steps into the batter's box. Legere is one for two so far in this game. So here's the O to Legere. Legere is going to fly out to Fantone here, and that'll end the inning. One runner gets aboard on the walk, but can't go down and score. The game is still tied with the bottom of the fifth, coming right up. For college sports. There's light at the end of the tunnel. A return to normal, and all we love about sports. You've instilled resilience, focus, and selflessness in us. We've put those lessons to work. We've found strength and unity in each other. You continue to take us places we never imagined. You bring out the best in us. So when we look forward, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We see a better world for all of us. And, and for the college sports. sports. In NCAA Division II, student athletes leave a lasting impression on their communities. That's because Division II student athletes want to make a difference and truly be part of their surrounding communities. Through community engagement, thousands of student athletes from various backgrounds interact with community members who view them as role models. This interaction leaves a positive and perhaps even life-changing impression on all those involved. In Division II, we rise to the opportunity and make community engagement ours. So we are back for the bottom of the fifth. It's been quiet on the score sheet so far. Both Tampa and Nova Southeastern haven't been able to find a run yet. They've had a combined seven runners stranded. Now, Miranda Perez hoping to start on the bottom of the fifth well for the Spartans. That's going to be a fly deep in the center. And it's going to be a good job by Legere to track it down and make a beautiful running catch. Makes it look relatively easy, but that's one of the harder plays to make. Running backward and having to get the glove in the right spot to pull it in. Yeah, and looking up into the sun, too. But credit Miranda Perez, though, for giving that ball a good ride. And the Spartans. Bottom of the fifth now. Trying to be the first ones to get up on the scoreboard. And there's Balmer taking the first pitch and fouling it out of play. But it's not out of play enough for Tia Williams to not be able to get it. Williams tracks it down, and immediately, two runners up and two of them down for the Spartans. So a very quick bottom of the fifth. Two pitches, two outs, and Perkins is now up with two outs. I don't think she expected to be up this fast in this inning. She is one for one with a single back in the third inning. And that will be fouled away, so the three pitch inning dream is done and dusted. Perkins trying the slap hit there as UT anxious to get a runner aboard. And they know if they can get a runner aboard for Gallhouse, it would definitely help them out. So here's the old one to Perkins. Swing and a miss for strike two. If Perkins can't get on base, it would mean the top of the lineup would be up for the Spartans in the sixth. few players in the bullpen, potentially a little action, but no need for a change right now as Connor is wheeling and dealing. Ball one right here though. Connor now ready from the circle to one two. That's going to be taken outside for ball two. Avery Perkins Got to be feeling good here after the first two Spartan batters were retired so quickly and trying to go deep in this count. Two and two here with two outs. 
In the bottom of the fifth, Connor taking her time. Readies to Perkins. Perkins is going to fly that up and fall straight back down. That is the third out. A 1-2-3 inning once again for Nova Southeastern. That was a good play by Burke to track it down, make the out, and now we'll enter the top of the sixth, tied at zero. You might not expect me, a Yankees fan, to be singing Sweet Caroline, but hey, it's a fun song to sing. It's the top of the sixth right here. It's a 0-0 ball game and an exciting conclusion to the Nova Tampa series. The first two games both ended in 3-2 Nova Southeastern victories, but so far it's been scoreless. Feldman has had a great job in the mound with 69 pitches in five innings, doing good in the circle with three Ks, only one walk allowed, and three hits allowed. Here's the first pitch of the inning. It's going to be dropped for a bunt, and Feldman makes a nice play to first to get the first out. So Langwell's bunt does not work this time. One away. Langwell was the number two hitter, so we'll see the number three hitter now, Tia Williams, and followed immediately thereafter by Allie Janowick, and right in the heart of the Nova Southeastern order here in the top of the sixth with one away. And that one's going to be taken for strike one. Tia Williams, 0 of 2 so far. Weber has hit over 400 this season. So she's always a threat to get on base. Here's the 0-1 from Feldman. Taken just up high for ball one. That one's going to be taken low. Two and one now. Good job at Williams with a good eye to get now ahead in the count. Tia Williams, incidentally, from up in Land Lakes, maybe not as hometown as her teammates, That two of them from Plant City, one from here in Tampa, and one St. Pete, but I guess honorable mention, especially given the closer proximity to Namoli Family Stadium than certainly down in Fort Lauderdale. Three and one, the count on her. Williams get a chance to get on base here. Three and one. That's going to be taken for strike two. So now the count goes full. The payoff pitch with one out right here. Williams is going to pop that bunt up. And will, it's actually full swing. It's not really a bunt. It will just be a foul ball. It's always a little tricky to tell in those plays because it wasn't a complete swing. I think it was partially pulled back when there was contact. Now, disappointing, of course, that Chevalier couldn't hang on to that. Otherwise, there'd be two outs. But Williams lives to see at least one more pitch. Although that one's going to go foul down the left field line, so she'll live to see even one more pitch in this at-bat. And taking a look over to the left, and it looked like it was one of the fans who were able to catch it. So a good catch there on that ball that went out of play. So we'll get another 3-2 pitch right here. The 3-2. That's going to be into the gap. 
Staying at first is Williams, as there's a good job by Gallhouse to make sure that it doesn't turn into a double. But a good at bat that ends up being Williams' first hit of the ball game. And that's four hits now for the Sharks, and they're hoping that it's the first of more to come as they push the door slightly ajar open and try to make something out of this top of the sixth inning with neither team yet to cross the plate so far. Stealing second is Williams, and Williams will be able to do so. So now a runner will be in scoring position with one out. Janowick hoping to get another RBI here. I'll tell you, from up here, that looked a little closer than as quickly as the umpire signaled safe. Yeah, I just don't think the tag was down in time was the only thing, but the throw certainly did, which is unfortunate. Yeah, Chevalier was out nice and quick with the throw over to second. And regardless, the Sharks find themselves with a runner in scoring position with only one out. And now the 1-1 one -one on the way, and that one's outside for ball two to Janowick. So Janowick getting ahead in a count for what will be a tricky at-bat indeed with a runner in scoring position with only one out. Here's the 2-1, Feldman firing. It's gonna be taken inside for ball three. Strike two, just a late call from the ump. The 2-2 two, two to Janowick. Taken outside for ball three, so we'll have a full count here. And this is where Mary Beth Feldman needs to close the door. You don't want the Sharks to have an opportunity here with only one out to put a second runner aboard. And there's going to be a drive to left. Fantone chasing. Can't do it. Rounding third and heading home will be Williams. And the Sharks will take a one-run lead off the RBI double. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Janowick gave that ball an awfully good ride. And Fantone, despite her best efforts, just not able to cover the ground in enough time to make the catch. And then by that time, the relay was not going to be home in time. And so an RBI double that gives the Sharks the first run of the game. Grounded to short. Palmer, a good play to first to get the second out right here. And this being the top of the sixth, all of a sudden the Spartans need to shut this down right away. There's not a whole lot of time left in terms of Spartan at-bats now that the first run has gone on the scoreboard in favor of the visitors. And there's going to be a ball out of play. Both infielders run at it together. And that is just a horrific failure of communication. What already wasn't a great day for Balmer just getting worse. And really trying not to say a lot here, but it was very clearly being tracked down by Curran Miner. I don't think Balmer needed to try to make a play on that yeah, one. Yeah, I'm not really sure why Steph closed in on that one. Curran Miner had clearly called for it and was in position to make the catch. Balmer going to make up for it here by getting the final out on the ground out. But... Not great to see two teammates bump into each other like that. The Sharks are able to score and take the lead, so the pressure is back on the Spartans entering the bottom of the sixth. We'll be right back. Just another ordinary day at UT.
Mariah Galehouse leads for the Spartans. It's the bottom of the sixth. It had been a tied game up until then. It was an RBI double from center fielder Ali Janowick. First baseman, Janowick. Who driven it to left field to bring home a run. First pitch to Gallhouse. Grounds it down the third baseline, but rolls out of play. Let's see if Gellhouse can deliver here in the bottom of the sixth. The good news from the Spartans' perspective is that they're only down by one. The bad news is they only have two hits in the game, and it is as late as the bottom of the sixth. They also don't have a lot of pitches on Ashley Connor, who's only had 47 entering the at-bat, and has been incredibly tough for the Spartans to deal with. They haven't been able to score any runs while Connor's been on the mound so far. Now that rise ball there got away from her, evening the count at 1-1. One and one. The 1-1. One, one. Gallhouse going to ground it and get on base for the third Spartans hit. So not the best start in the circle this inning for Connor, especially with the heart of Tampa's order coming up with Fantone ready right here. Well, that's certainly what the Spartans fans wanted to see, and it's kind of what you expect from your leadoff hitter and as you made the point earlier, Taylor, probably a good reason why they put her in the number one spot for the second game. And so Fantone now the number two hitter who's one for two. And a bunt that rolls foul. And so still to come this half inning for the Spartans will be Corinne Miner and Lexi Chevalier now that there's a runner aboard. So the top of the order, one through four hitters, all with an opportunity here to try to get the Spartans at least into a tie. So the 0-1 here to Fantone. Fantone will drop down the bunt. Can't beat the throw, but it does enough to get Gullhouse to second. Corinne Miner 0 for 2 in this game and still nonetheless probably one of the top players you would want stepping into the batter's box in this situation and desperately needing a hit and would love to see it be to the outfield. That would allow Galehouse to come all the way around from second. First pitch to Miner, and that'll be taken inside for ball one. Miner was able to get on base last time via error, but that was the only time she's been able to get on base all day. So definitely due for a hit, and I know the fans will want to see Tampa's best bat getting back to work. Here's the 1-0 to Miner. That and hitter. that, that plunks her, so she'll get on base. Yeah, I I, for all intents and purposes, heard that one all the way up here. It looks like we're going to get a pinch hitter as Lexi Chevalier heads back to the dugout. She was scheduled to hit next. And so Miner now on first and Galhouse on second. And that's really what you ask for is for your leadoff hitters to get on base. And so the sec successful sacrifice by Fantone. You see Galhouse and Miner both aboard. And, and now, now this change that's going to bring to the plate Siegel is going to be back in as a pinch hitter last time Siegel stepped in to pinch hit she was able to drive home an RBI yeah we saw her pinch hit for Balmer in game one and so being asked to do the same thing here in the bottom of the sixth of game two with only one out so we'll have to see if Siegel can find some more success right here one out, two on. Gunners dealt with the situation before. And the Spartans capitalized this time. Taken high and away for ball one. Yeah, that one was way outside. And be interesting to watch and see if Ashley Connor, if, if the pressure gets to her, if the heat gets to her, if the fact that she's pitched this whole game, pitched a little bit of the first one. The 1-0. And that'll be taken for... Ooh, I thought that one was a strike, but no, indeed, it's a ball. It's a Siegel up two on the count. The economical pitch count aside for Connor, still a very challenging time here with her team only up one to nothing. And let's see if those factors that I mentioned come into play. If she can maintain her composure. And Siegel takes that one for strike one. See, that one's a little weird. I thought that one was a ball and the one before was a strike. But either way... It's still now a 2-1 count. 
Siegel still ahead. But that strike will help Connor out just a bit. So pressure in the circle here. 2 1 with one out, bottom of the sixth. That's going to be taken inside. Ball three. I know that Russo is going to be ready on deck. Hoping to get a chance here, potentially, but the base is loaded. 3 1 count to Siegel. Connor firing from the circle. And that is taken for ball four. The bases are loaded for Russo. And Russo isn't always the strongest bat to get on base, but has been a bat that is great at slugging and getting extra base hits. So almost a dream scenario. <laughs> and so, like I've said before, Russo has wanted some revenge after having the runners on second and third with two outs in the seventh in the last game and having it go to waste. A chance now to try to give Tampa the lead. That's going to be taken for ball strike one. Yeah, you're Late really not going to get a much better opportunity than this. And if the Spartans are going to try to steal one game of this three-game series, this is really it right here, this at-bat. The 0-1 here to Russo. That is going to be taken a little bit low for ball one. It isn't a two-out situation, so it will give Jansen a chance if Russo can't get it done. But you know Russo would love to get the offense going here. 1-1 one, one with the bases loaded and one out. Russo fouls it away, so it's now one and two. Let's make sure to credit Abigail Siegel coming through, reaching base, which is what the coach wants in those pinch hit situations when you're tapped on the shoulder. Base is loaded. The one two, it's gonna be grounded to short. Play at the plate. So they will stop the run from scoring. So the fielder's choice will get Russo on base and not allow a double play. But Tampa still needs to find that run and Emily Jansen will have a chance to do so with two outs. Yeah, it's interesting when you had said Emily Jansen will get a chance to hit this inning in my head. I thought, well, not if there's a double play. And when they threw it home, I quickly watched catcher Madison Fine to see if she was going to try to fire it down to first in time to try to get that double play. And fortunately for Spartans fans, no such case. And so the bases remain loaded, although now there's two outs. So some real pressure here for Emily Jansen. Jansen takes ball one here. This is probably one of the more high leverage bats you'll have in your career in UT, apart from any major postseason ones. That one's going to be taken inside for strike one. Just inside the zone, although it was on the outside corner. The 1-1 one, one here. There's going to be a drive to left field. Dragging it down is Alexis Smith and dropped it in foul territory. So the inning and at-bat stay alive. Interesting because you can see the Nova Southeastern fans in the crowd, how disappointed they were that she didn't make that catch. But I think disappointed is the right word because no harm, no foul. It's still a foul ball. And she's made so many catches for them in left field today. Can't hold that one against her. And also a sigh of relief for Tampa fans, thinking that the bases loaded opportunity could be gone. The one-two here for Emily Jansen. That's going to be grounded to second. The play to first. Ooh, good catch as it almost goes too far. But agonizingly for the Spartans, four more runner, three more runners left on base. As we enter the top of the seventh, the, sh the Sharks still lead one to nothing. This is the University of Tampa. UT students travel from across the nation and around the globe to join a dynamic learning community. There are 150 academic programs, continuing studies for non-traditional students, and a highly ranked graduate school. Academic opportunities are extensive and rigorous, but this mid-sized residential campus retains a welcoming feel. With a student-faculty ratio of 16 to 1, students benefit from direct interaction with expert faculty, 
a faculty that is passionate about teaching and mentoring. Outside the classroom, UT enjoys a unique environment. Plant Hall, a national historic landmark, is surrounded by modern and historic buildings on 105 acres. UT's beautiful downtown riverfront setting offers a gateway to the heart of a vibrant city. Students are within walking distance of jobs and internships, and the recreational opportunities are endless, both off-campus and on-campus. I don't either. We are back for top of the seventh. Still 1-0 after Tampa lost an opportunity to bring any one of the bases loaded runners home. That first pitch here is going to be taken for strike one. Nonetheless, as I've said repeatedly, it's been a very entertaining day of softball and Chamber of Commerce weather, as they call it, 87 degrees right now. And that one sails up high for ball one. Obviously, the Spartans fans want to see a split of this doubleheader, but I think everyone will agree that regardless of the outcome, they can leave feeling that they saw some really great softball today. The 1-1 one -one here is going to be taken just high for ball two. And a good uh, showdown between the Sunshine State Conference rivals. I wonder if they'll have any chance to play each other in the tournament later on. 2-1 count here for Hendricks. Hendricks will foul that away, and it does go out of play. Count goes to 2-2. Two two. And I think the prospect of facing each other down the road in postseason play, if you're the Spartans with the way things have been going, you say, no thanks. And in the case of the Sharks, they say, sure, we'd love to. So now the 2-2. Two -two. That one's going to be driven to left field. And oh, can't be corralled there by Fantone. And it is a first leadoff double for the Sharks. Gets to the wall. And a good job there by Fantone to be able to pick it up and turn it around. But still, the damage done on a double, so a good start by Hendricks. It brings up Burke with a runner in scoring position. And so far, the Sharks are 1-7 with runners in scoring position, and 2-11 of 11 with runners on. Haley First Hendricks pitch. there with probably the longest ball hit in the three-game series between last night's game and all the ball that's been played here so far today. So there's the 1-0 taken outside. That's going to be a bunt and a diving catch by Chevalier. Yes, and they will call it out because that indeed was a catch. It's one of the plays where we have a good view on it because there's no real major obstruction. Yeah, I'll tell you what, Lexi Chevalier really laid herself out for that and I think kind of looked at the home plate umpires to say, darn well, better be an out after what I just put myself through to make that catch. And so you see... Gets one away here in the top of the seventh. That one taken high and outside for ball one. Keep so in mind that Lexi had that ball that went off of the inside of her elbow earlier, and now that one there, she looked like she was kind of favoring her waistline a little bit. It's been a rough day for her physically. But Chevalier is a bit of an iron woman, able to take the beating and keep going with so many starts, always being a consistent player behind home plate. Ball two there. After that one goes a bit high. Feldman, 93 pitches entering the at-bat. 2-0. And ooh, trying to steal third. And we'll get it as Miner, I don't think was fully ready, and drops the ball. But the swing and miss will lead to the 2-1 count. That's unfortunate because the throw was certainly in time, and Miner just bobbled it. And that's the difference between the Sharks now having a runner on third or the bases being empty. The 2-1 here. That's going to be taken outside for ball three. Three and one. So Smith with a runner at third ahead in the count. Going to lay down the bunts. And goes foul for strike two. A 
Alexis Smith so off to the races. She needs to conserve some of that energy for a ball that's in play. So now the 3-2 from Feldman, the payoff pitch. That's foul behind. And we've got one more in store. Smith already driving a deep at bat. Now a chance to try to drive home a run that would put the Sharks up by two. Full count pitch once more. That is taken for strike three. So Smith strikes out looking and Feldman will get a fourth of the game. Yeah, that's a huge out. And leaves the Sharks with two outs in the top of the seventh and a big opportunity for the Spartans here if they can close this out, trailing only by one and still having three more at-bats in the bottom of the seventh at minimally. So Legere... 0-1 here, has a hit already, but hope to get another to try to drive the run home. That's going to be taken outside for ball one. And looking ahead to the bottom of the seventh, the seven, eight, nine hitters due up for the Spartans, Perez, Balmer, and Perkins. If Mary Beth Feldman can close out the Sharks here in the top of the seventh. The 1-1 is going to be grounded to short. Balmer, the throw to first, gets it in time, and the side is retired. And making up for the little error in the sixth inning, Balmer being able to not let the run score. There is one runner that gets on base, but isn't able to get home. Tampa will get one more shot entering the bottom of the seventh up next. is the University of Tampa. Explore your dreams. Discover your talents. Get ready to invent, innovate, and be a leader. This is the University of Tampa. Bottom of the seventh. Last chance saloon is open and run in business again. Tampa needs a run to stay alive, and Miranda Perez is going to lead off for the Spartans. Perez has had some good hits in the at-bat after a strikeout in the second inning, and will hope to try to get on base here. That one's going to be taken low for ball one. So Connors had a great day from the circle and hoping to finish out what could be a shutout. Writing the 1-0. Perez. Taken for strike one. And when we recently saw the Spartans end the inning with the bases loaded, that upped the total to six on the day in terms of runners left on base in the second game of the doubleheader, nine left on base in game one. Perez is going to foul that away. It stays in enough. And Janowick will get the first out of the seventh inning. Two to go for the Spartans. And it looks like there will be another pinch hitter. Balmer 0 of 2. And they are going to be bringing up Lily Keister. And Keister had a hit in the last time around in the previous game. And they're hoping Keister can get on base once again. After Keister, Perkins is one of two. And after that is Gullhouse, who's one of three. Keister played center field in the first game and was two for three and scored a run. So a uh, good choice here, good substitution by head coach Leslie Cantor. Seeing if Keister could be a difference maker here in game two. Keister, the 0-0, -0, 
taken for strike one. The 0 1 here for Keister with one out. Entering the at bat, Connor's only at seven pitches, 70 pitches. Checking the wrist. That's going to be taken for strike two. Keister already down 0 2 here. Avery Perkins waiting on deck. And Keister, who has given the appearance of trying to register a slap hit here. That one's going to be taken outside for ball one. Different take on that one for her. The count will now be one and two for Keister. Connor in the circle trying to get the second out here in the inning. The one two. That's going to be taken outside once again. Two and two. Good eye there. Good eye by Keister. And hanging tough here in the top of the seventh, battling through this at bat. Connor checks the wrist and is ready with the 2 2 to Keister. Keister goes. And he's going to say that he didn't, she didn't check up in time. So that is strike three, the second of the game for Connor. And he'll bring up Perkins with two outs here. So the pinch hitter not able to get the job done. And you can see that Cantor not very happy with the, with the call. Just, I think, saying, hey, I thought that was a checkup in time. But no chance of overturning it here. So Perkins now up with one out to go. The Spartans need her to get on base to keep the game alive. Yeah, it's on her shoulders, and boy, they'd love to see her get aboard with Mariah Galhaus being the on-deck hitter. First pitch taken for a strike one, and I thought that was a tad outside, but again, it is the view from up here. It is a little skewed to the right. So the 0-1 here for Perkins. Connor trying to secure a sweep for the Sharks. Going to be fouled away for strike two. So we could potentially be one pitch away. Avery Perkins, though, one for two. She knows that she can hit off of Ashley Connor. Just needs to repeat it here in the seventh. That one's going to be taken just outside. Ball one. The one and two, last chance here for the Spartans, potentially. Connor checks the wrist, readies and fires. That's going to be grounded to short, picked up clean enough, throw to first, in time. And the Sharks will complete a sweep with a one nothing victory. And the tale of what this three-game weekend series has been is that the Spartans are just not clutch. With seven, six left on base this time around, they're not able to score a single runner. Well, even though the Sharks also left six on base, they did score one. So they do find a 1-0 win. So on Friday night, it was a 3-2 win. Saturday, a 3-2 win. And here, a 1-0 win to extend the Sharks' winning streak and to continue the Spartans' losing streak. I'll tell you what, though. That final out of the game, that looked awfully, awfully close from up here. I would have loved to have seen a replay. They always say the tie goes to the runner. To me, that looked like the little bit of a bobble that Samantha Burke had and then the great speed coming out of the batter's box by Avery Perkins. And I thought that was going to keep things alive for Galehouse, but it wasn't meant to be and this just was not the weekend that the Spartans wanted it to turn into as the visitors come into their stadium and take all three games. And as you mentioned, one run differential in all three of those but the Spartans have a lot of work to do, what with six games coming up next week by way of doubleheaders on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And so a disappointing weekend for them here against Nova Southeastern, who comes up from Fort Lauderdale and sweeps the three-game set. And so disappointing for the home team and their fans, as obviously the Sharks and all the fans that they brought with them very thrilled with their time here in West Central Florida. And so with that, an exciting weekend of baseball has come to an end, as well as softball, because the Tampa Spartans were also playing over at the other field. But unfortunately for softball fans here, 
Not the best day for the Spartans, but if you're a Sharks fan, we thank you for tuning in, and congratulations on walking away with a third straight win against the Spartans and further on the streak. So the tale of the tape will be that Feldman, pitching a complete game of seven innings, will take a loss thanks to the one earned run alongside four strikeouts, six hits, and one walk allowed. Connor was able to go a complete game here, securing a second win a second or a win and a second good decision of the day, as she also was able to get a save in the second game. She pitched seven innings, got two strikeouts, with only one walk allowed and only three hits allowed. So that'll do it from the Moly Family Stadium. I'm Taylor Storthy. And I'm Bruce Wozniak. We'll see you back here on Tuesday afternoon at 3 o'clock as the Spartans play a doubleheader against Minnesota Duluth.